Get up, superstar. It's time to shine. Here's to the fierce queens, the delusional dreamer, the one who thinks she's all that because she marches to the beat of her own drum. She's not afraid to embrace her flaws, and she finds power in using failure as fuel for evolution. Defying the limits imposed by perfectionism and imposter syndrome, she faces her fears with full confidence in God, because the one who put her here also called her to have dominion here. My name is Barbara Moachi, your online bestie and chair executive officer. Join me and women across the world who refuse to let fear keep them from their wildest dreams. This is Boldly Becoming. So if you follow me on social media, then you know that I am my boyfriend's biggest fan. Like, I am obsessed with my boyfriend. And I think it's worse for the people who follow me on TikTok because that's all I ever talk about on TikTok. My boyfriend, how great he is and how fabulous I think he is. And I couldn't help but reflect literally this morning. So just to give you a backstory, very unnecessary backstory, but because we're besties and besties like giving each other unnecessary detail, I'm going to do that. Um, my boyfriend recently made... A very bold decision like a big bad bold decision and in the beginning you know things were looking like he made a big bad bold decision and as time went by things started to come together and now finally things have come together he got the email he's been waiting for we're all super proud of him and I remember being at the mall yesterday and I literally spent like a good three hours at the mall just trying to think of a subtle gift because like I don't know what's wrong with me, but I feel like no matter what is in my bank account, like whether I've got 50 rand or I've got 200,000 rand, which by the way, hasn't happened yet. <laughs> it unfortunately hasn't happened yet, but our time is coming. Our time is coming. Whatever amount is in my bank account, I always find the urge or have the urge to go out and get him gifts. Like if he sneezes, three times instead of 10 times in a day, I'm like, I should buy him a gift. I should buy him a gift to let him know that I'm proud of him for sneezing three times instead of 10 times today. You know, if whatever, whatever anyone does, I'm just like, no, this deserves a gift. This needs to be rewarded with flowers. This needs to be rewarded with something. And most of the time, fine, I may not have the funds to act out on my urge, but when there is something, whether it's a 10 rand or a 20 rand, I'm going to act upon the urge. And yesterday, after spending three hours finding the perfect gift for him, which I did, and it was under 100 rand, so high five to me because... <laughs> I came home, I gave it to him, he loved it. He said it was perfect. I said, yes, I am the best gift giver in the world. I'm the best girlfriend in the world. I am just amazing. Isn't my boyfriend the luckiest man alive? I then started to think, wait, guys, I am so obsessed with my boyfriend. I mean, not in an unhealthy way, obviously, right? Because everything I just mentioned was healthy. But I'm so obsessed and enamored, if that's the right context to use this word in, by this man that it had me thinking whether I had ever been in love before. Like, I was like, have I ever been in love before? Because the way you make me feel, like, I'm just like, no ways, it can't be. And so I kind of sat in my room for like a good two hours, just thinking about my whole life and the whole 24 years that make up my existence. And whether I was ever in love, but more than whether I was ever in love, reflecting on the times that I was, not in love, not because I was in a wrong relationship or whatever reason people have for not being in love, but genuinely just because there was no one in my life at the time. I was very much single. Most of it was because of my own decision making, right? Not that I like did anything weird, but just like I had decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And in that year of my life, I just felt like because I want to dedicate this year to really calibrating and hearing which direction God wants me to move in, I don't want the distraction of having a relationship because I know how I get. I am a number one lover girl in the world. Like it will consume my mind. I'm constantly thinking of you, ways to show you that I appreciate you, I love you, all of these different things. And I think for a lot of us, we are lover girls. And we have a lot of feelings that we, or love rather, that we want to share and 
just want to give to somebody, but there really isn't anyone to give that love to. And I don't know about you, but have you ever reached a moment in your singleness where you're just like, oh man, this sucks. Like, and not this sucks because being single sucks. Don't get me wrong. Being single is amazing. And I will take being single any day because I love it with my entire being. But I think there are moments in your singleness where you're sitting by yourself in your room and you've got all this love beating in your chest. But there's no one to share it with. Like, you just want to call someone and ask them about their day and hear about their day and then tell them about your day and like pour out your feelings about your day. Let them pour out their feelings about and just like have that bond with somebody who's just sitting on the other end of the phone or the other end of the room waiting on every single word that comes out of your mouth because they just they just love you and they they just you know they're just captivated by you and everything that you are that they just want to know your thoughts your feelings what hurts you what makes you happy what makes you smile and they go out of their way to make you smile and and then there's no one <laughs> And then there's no one, but your friends are there. I mean, you know, you've got your girlfriends or your boyfriends, you know, whoever your friends or makes up the demographic of your friendships. But as much as your friends are sitting on the phone with you and you guys are speaking about your day and whatever, there's just like a level of connection that I'm looking for that my friend is not able to give me. And I've had multiple phone calls like this where I just call my friends and I'm like, Tommy, I'm lonely. And we'd sit on the phone and just speak to each other. But even in that speaking, we end up crying with each other because we're both single and we're both lonely in this moment. And what we are giving each other <laughs> is not giving what it needs to give for us to be given. You understand what I'm saying? And I think a lot of the times I feel guilty or I felt guilty in those moments because obviously as a Christian, you know, and not just like as a Christian, but like you are a leader in the church. Like you lead small groups, you lead cell groups, whatever that looks like. You serve on the, on the choir, you serve at the, at the door where everyone walks in and you greet them. You do all of these different things. So assuming that you're in those positions, even if you're not, just the fact that your relationship with God is as strong as, as, and as deep as you say it is, shouldn't you feel completely satisfied by your relationship with God? Like, that's how I felt. I always felt guilty in my moments of loneliness because it was like, damn, Barbara, like, shouldn't you find, like, unloneliness in God? Like, shouldn't you find comfort in the presence of God, you know? The Bible says that the, the Holy Spirit is near to those who are low in spirit. You're low in spirit. Shouldn't you just be trying to draw nearer to the Holy Spirit? And I think there's so much guilt that you can experience as a child of God because the love of God should be enough for you. But also you're a whole and healed girl and you've got all these fabulous girlfriends around you. So shouldn't their presence also just like fill you and, and make you like, shouldn't you... That is greed. What, how many more people do you want to love you? Like, that is very greedy. And it's like, yes, it's true. I'm a woman of God. Yes, I love Jesus. And yes, the love of God is enough for me. But God is not going to come down and cuddle me, is he? God is not going to come down and hug me. But then I think, for me, it's so complex because I grew up as an eldest daughter. And for those of you that don't know, like, my parents are divorced. And like, hey, it's a whole story. Like, my whole life, Nje, was like a whole drama in my childhood so that resulted in me feeling like nobody forced me to it's not to say that there weren't loving adults around me or my grandparents weren't there or my mom wasn't there or my dad wasn't there either like it's not to say anybody failed at their job but for me as someone who just liked to assume responsibility because I was an overachiever I always felt like I had to be the strong one never really diving into my emotions and I remember when I started doing therapy a couple of years ago my therapist asked me like so what do you think is going to happen if you allow yourself to feel your emotions like do you feel like if you just face your sadness or face your loneliness or face whatever negative emotion you're feeling do you feel like 
your life will just un unravel. Like, do you feel like things will fall out of place? And I think when I sat down years back, this was like 2020, 2021, just thinking about that question, I came to realize that looking at my childhood, the reason why I never expressed my emotions, whether, well, I mean, good emotions, I guess I could express, but like, I always felt the burden never to give in to the weak emotions, never give in to the crying, the sadness, the moping, the feeling sorry for myself because a part of me felt like not allowing myself to go in that direction meant that I had control over my life. It meant that I could just you know, keep everything together, make sure that my mom is okay, my brother is okay, my sister's okay, my dad is okay, my grandmother's okay, everyone around me is okay, their emotions are fine. And whenever anyone needed some emotional support of any kind, whether they just wanted to talk, whether they wanted to feel validated, I was their girl. I was there to validate, I was there to listen, I was there to do all of those things. And again, this is a responsibility I took upon myself. So in no way do I feel any sort of resentment or like, sense of abandonment towards anyone but that behavior almost led me to becoming a robot someone actually made this statement in primary school way before i realized that i was hard in my heart and i wouldn't allow myself to feel emotions and this boy basically said um <laughs> Trying to Mac on Barbara is like trying to Mac on a brick wall. And I remember the guys around were agreeing like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure dating her feels the same way. This was probably like in grade five, grade six. So I was like, what, 12, 13 years old? Well, 11, 12 years old. And basically the boys were just agreeing that they feel like if they had to show any sort of affection, like, or interest towards me, I just bounce it back at them. So take a ball, like if you bought a brand new basketball and you threw it against the wall, it would bounce back as hard as you threw it because it's a wall, it, it's not gonna absorb it. It's gonna bounce back everything that you throw at them. And I think sometimes I was actually reading a book. If you watch my vlog with the wisdom tooth that my boyfriend's mom bought me, um, in the very first like chapter, it speaks about baggage and the baggage that sometimes women carry. And we tend to cover it up with a whole lot of things. And all of us have different coping mechanisms. Some of us laugh and make jokes out of the situations that we're going through as a way to kind of cope with what we're experiencing. Some of us, you know, eat. I'm, I'm those people. I like don't want to feel negative emotions and when i think i get to the peak of that not wanting to feel anything i'll go out buy the biggest meal i possibly can think of at that moment a bottle of coke and just eat eat until i'm so tired i have no choice but to pass out and if i pass out then i don't have to confront what i'm feeling and i don't have to deal with my emotions so it's safe to say that we all have different ways of dealing and coping with um stress and negative emotions and in this book, it speaks about baggage and how sometimes the baggage that we carry as women and the labels that we carry on ourselves aren't even things that actually happened. Like they aren't even things that are actual experiences that we went through. It's just an idea that somebody spoke out loud and now you take that idea and you make it your identity. And so for me, from like grade five going onwards, I always just thought to myself, yeah, that's kind of true. Cause I heard it so much like, you know, they are kind of right. I am a brick wall, aren't I? And then I just assumed that was my identity and I became a brick wall. So in my friendships, I wouldn't hug my friends. Still to this day, I'm sure like most of my childhood friends, it's still a very awkward thing for us to hug each other because we're getting used to it. And I think also it's just the environment that we grew up in where showing emotion, whether positive or negative, was a negative thing. So a lot of us are just very like, you know, like tough and staunch. And yeah, we just don't wanna show a lot of emotion. And that's something that we're all actively trying to work out of. So we, from time to time, you know, we'll hug each other. Like, hey girl, love. <laughs> and then keep it moving. But with my newer friends, my adulthood friends, it's much more easier because obviously they don't know that I'm a brick wall. So I was able to embrace this whole idea of like, okay, these are new people. They don't know who I am. I'm just going to give them all the love I have and let's see how they take it. And they took it well. And I was like, oh, so I've got like a group of friends that I love openly. And then a group of friends that, that I think they know I love them, but like, I'm not going to show it on my chest like what am i weak 
no, <laughs> no. And so the dilemma that I found as I started intentionally moving in my dating life was that the same way that I found it difficult to express myself at home was the same way that I found it difficult to express myself in friendships. And the same way I found it difficult to express myself in friendships was almost the same way that I found it difficult to express myself in romantic relationships. And so what would happen is instead of going on a date and evaluating whether this is someone that I like, I would sit on a date and try and be the person who validates the other individual or listens and, and plays the emotional support. And basically, almost like a people pleaser. That, that's essentially what I was my entire childhood, a people pleaser. Because I didn't want to unsettle the environment. I didn't want to rattle any bones and, and, you know, like cause anything to rift in the atmosphere. I was always just trying to make sure that things stay as peaceful as possible. But now, if you are trying to intentionally spend the rest of your life with somebody, I don't think that approaching dating like that where you are only showing a certain element of yourself or you are holding back who you are allowing the other person to freely express themselves and freely show themselves as they please is helpful because by the time you realize you don't like this person you're probably way too deep in it to not hurt and cause resentment in the other individual. Like I remember when I started talking to my current boyfriend and a whole lot of other guys, because in that time I was really intentional about going to dates, but going on dates and listening to the other person, not to hear how I can validate or support or whatever the case may be, but to actually hear if this is somebody that I feel like I like and if it's someone that I feel like challenges me I can grow with you know we're compatible and all of that jazzy relationship stuff and I hope that it's okay with you that I get a little deep but looking back at my childhood I think I realized that I didn't feel safe to express myself fully because I was looking to be accepted and not necessarily to belong to the spaces that I was in I remember at the time that my parents were going through their divorce slash separation. For me, my biggest priority was I don't like seeing my mom emotionally a wreck. I don't enjoy seeing her hurting and in pain. So whatever I can do, whether it means doing extra chores around the house or saying less in moments where I can see that, you know, there, there isn't really, um, this isn't really a good time for me to you know, being, wow, 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 being the crazy girl that everybody knows I am, I dial it down back. And so my behavior and my mood and how I express myself, regardless of what I felt on the inside and what I wanted to do in that moment, was always dependent on my mom and how best I can accommodate and make sure that she's well. Same thing goes for my siblings. So if my little brother was crying because my parents just had a major fight and he's frightened and blah, 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 and all these different things are happening, instead of me sitting down and crying because I'm also shook and I'm also scared and I'm also confused, I'm going to hold all of that back to be strong for my younger brother so that he can express and release everything that he needs to release in order to heal from whatever it is that he needs to heal from in this current moment. So I kind of found myself doing that, not just at home, but even when I was at school, I'd do the same thing. I once told you the story on my very first podcast episode, I think, of the teacher who um, told me that I should try to not be so great because if I'm going to be good at everything and if I'm going to be the best in every category, then I'm going to make other kids feel bad about themselves because they just will never be able to be the best because I'm always being the best. So just try not to be the best. And so I would always be over analyzing every step that I take and every opportunity that I got at school because I didn't want to make anyone feel less than by being my best self. I don't know if that makes sense. And I think there's a little bit of politics around that that I still need to sit with and probably do some research around and, and just like understand the science behind it because I understand the idea of 
not putting other people down and not making other people feel less than. But like, what happens when you are a fish in the water and everybody else is a, is a tiger in the water and we have to race? Am I not going to be the fastest? <laughs> like, this is my natural habitat. Like, am I not going to flourish? What happens when you're a seed in good soil? Like, are you just not going to bloom? Like, are you just going to, like, stay in the dark mud so that other things around you don't feel bad? Like, okay, the sun mustn't shine too bright because then the moon is going to feel bad about its inability to light up the world and keep everything lit. If this duck and this chicken had to race in this pond, of course the duck is going to win. But does the duck winning mean that the chicken is bad? It doesn't mean that the chicken is bad. It just means that's not the chicken's best environment. Now, if the duck and the chicken were on solid ground, I don't know if the chicken would lose against the duck still. So there should be a balance between self-awareness from myself to know that, okay, this is not the environment that I flourish. So Samantha's win shouldn't mean that I'm less than. You just might be a chicken in a, in a, in a pond and all you have to do is move to dry land. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's a whole thing. But even in that, so I would go to school and now it's time to write tests. And now I'm nervous when we're writing exams and tests, not because I'm afraid to fail, but because I'm afraid to do too well. And then when I do too well, I'm afraid to celebrate it. I'm afraid to smile. I'm afraid to express the excitement of putting in work and getting the results of the work that I put in because I don't want to hurt other people's feelings. So every space that I went to, I kind of always felt like I was always reducing myself so that I would be more of what the next person needed. In the time that I was single and experiencing the loneliness that I was telling you about at the beginning of the episode, I kind of got to a point where I was like, if I have to be in a relationship, that is definitely something I don't want to have to deal with. Like no shade to anybody in my life <laughs> at all because obviously it was nobody's fault that I decided to be a shapeshifter for the sake of everyone around me because I thought that's what was best for everyone around me. I took that responsibility up upon myself. So in no way is it anyone's fault but myself because I chose to make those decisions. But for me, it's like, if I'm gonna be in a relationship with someone who I'm dating to marry, I don't want it to be somebody who I constantly feel like they are parts of me that I have to hide or they are parts of me that I just can't fully express because this person will judge me. And I know I felt like that in the past where like with one person, I couldn't necessarily um, be on social media all the time because he didn't like social media. In fact, he wanted me to get off Instagram and delete it, which is so funny because now X amount of years later, I literally do Instagram for a living where in the other instance, I couldn't really express my emotions at all like whenever I had any negative emotions or I was just feeling sick or if anything bad was going on in my life I just never felt free enough to be able to express that because then I felt like I would be showing this person that I'm not Christian enough and I'm not saved enough so that's a reason for them to break up with me because I'm just not a powerful woman of God who is unshaken by everything. And when people cut me, I start bleeding. What kind of Christian does that? Like, why would you bleed when people cut you? You shouldn't bleed. You're a woman of God. When people cut you, you should just remain standing, <laughs> you know? And, and that for me was a bit like, oh, I needed to take time to really sit down, reflect on my past, um, how I behaved, all of those kinds of things. And then looking into the future and the rest of my life, really ask myself the questions to say, is this the life we're going to live? Is this how I want to continue? Is this how I want my story to end? And so with that, I think I came up with a list of non-negotiables. And if you follow me on TikTok, then you would have seen the list of non-negotiables that I made um, regarding my next relationship. Like if I have to date, these are my non-negotiables. I need to feel safe enough. I need to feel like you care enough i need to yay i need to feel sana i need to feel and i'm so grateful to god that i do feel and so i'm really thankful to myself that i took that discipline to really say no to people who i really thought were fine and people i really thought were charming um because all of that does not compare 
to the person that I currently have now, which is amazing, right? But it's also not to say that in me getting into this relationship with him, it was a comfortable process. Because I remember when we first started talking, I told myself like, okay, here is this guy who seems to resemble the characteristics that we're looking for. <sighs> but you, ma'am, are a professional shapeshifter. You, ma'am, are a professional diplomatic, resilient person. <laughs> That's just how I can describe who I was slash am. I'm just very resilient and I will stick it out for the sake of the next person. And I didn't want that to be the case. And so the question that I put forward was, or statement, I don't know what it is, but the thought that I kind of just threw out at myself was, it's better for this person to see who you are in your fullness and reject you for being you than for you to try and keep up with a version that you know pleases them, but betrays and erases the actual you. You don't want to be in a situation where for the rest of your life, you don't feel like you can express yourself fully, whether that's expressing your love towards them or whether that's expressing your disagreement with whatever it is that they are doing or displaying. And I think what really made it easy for us to become really great friends, even within our relationship, is the fact that we're very candid with each other. Like my boyfriend is not allowed not allowed he's not afraid to tell me when he doesn't like something like actually like sometimes it bores me how unimpressed he can be like he just be unimpressed and i'm like be impressed and he's just like not impressed <laughs> it's like it's the craziest thing but at the same time i'm also the same i'm very difficult to impress sometimes and he knows that and i think what i really appreciate about him is if he does something and I'm not really moved by it. Not that I don't appreciate it, but I'm not like completely blown away by it. He doesn't take offense from it. He just gathers that information and does better the next time. And I think that's such a cool thing to have and a cool dynamic to have in our relationship because I just always feel like I get to fully express myself, not being scared of failing, because even if I fail, I'm going to just get back up and be a better person for it. I remember at the beginning of dating my boyfriend and, you know, like physical touch has always been at the bottom of my list for obvious reasons, just like I explained to you about my childhood and all those things and being a brick wall and then also feeling like I just have to be this rock for everybody and a pillar of strength for my family. And... I just never hugged people. So like for me, like if anyone touched me, I was immediately uncomfortable and it's immediately like, no, don't do it. So physical touch has always been at the bottom of my love language, so I thought, right? And my boyfriend being someone who I know from my childhood also knew very well that you don't dare hug Barbara. Like don't hug her, just leave her, let her be. Like just let her be because she doesn't like it. She doesn't like to be touched. Like it's weird. And I think as I grew older, I've obviously learned how to hug people because I learned that hugging people is polite. Like it's a way to greet people and people love to be hugged. Like people love to be hugged. Hi, I'm Barbara, nice to meet you. Hug, like it's, it's a thing, like it's a thing in society. I don't know who decided it must be a thing, but it is a thing. And so I just learned to do it because it's a social thing. And I need people to know that I'm friendly and approachable and I'm not angry, I don't hate you. Um, so yeah, other than that, like, like I said, with my friends, I, we just didn't hug because I don't need my friends to know I'm friendly. They know I'm friendly. So we just, hey man, what's up? Yo man, what's up? But the problem is at the core of who I am, I'm a lover girl. That's who I am. I wanna love you <laughs> every day, every night, right? So I decided to make this really brave move one day to just hug my boyfriend. And I remember we were going to go buy food for myself and his little brother, well, for us and his little brother. And he was coming down the stairs. I was waiting for him. And as he came down the stairs, I opened my arms like this and 
he kind of like looked at me strange like are you okay and I was like yeah I'm fine I just want a hug from you and he was like okay and then he hugged me and then we walk to the car finally opens the door I get in when it's time for us to get out I'm like Can I please have another hug so he gives me another hug and he's like are you fine like is everything okay why are you why do you want so many hugs and I'm like I just I just do I think this was probably like a month of us talking that I started to show those colors of like I need to be hugged every two minutes and now now it's a normal thing in our relationship where he just knows that I really love hugs like I love being hugged like he must hold me the moment that he walks into my presence he must hold me he must grab me when we walk around in public I don't hold his hand no I hold his hand and his arm do you understand I wanna hold him so so there's like there's like this whole thing where like even i remember with my friends where we had our first games night and we were all just kind of chilling there and it's a brown whatever and we're playing i think we're playing uno whatever it was that we we're playing but the whole time we we're playing i was like holding on to my boyfriend's arm and everybody was like what is wrong with you girl like is this you like are you this person and i am this person i just think I've never been in a relationship or a situation where I felt safe enough to express that side of myself. And I think the only reason that I do feel safe enough to express that side of myself in this relationship is because I was very intentional about showing my true colors from the beginning. So if you haven't caught it yet, <laughs> this is supposed to be a podcast episode. And usually at the end of my podcast episodes, I'll give you like three actionable steps of like the topic that I'm talking about and the way that you can like sort of conquer whether it's a fear of failure, a fear of stepping out of your comfort zone, that entire thing. So today's podcast episode is actually centered around the idea of comfort zones and comfort zones in the context of relationships. The benefits of stepping out of your comfort zone in a relationship and the benefits of yeah, yeah, and how to go about it. And that's why I'm kind of sharing my story. So the very first thing that I really wanted to share with you today was that number one, when you are embarking on a new relationship, whether it's a friendship platonic or a friendship to be relationship, if that's what you believe in, I don't know how you do your things, but whatever kind of relationship it is, is that I am a firm believer now in just leaving your heart and your cards on the table. Pour everything out, give that person your full self. But I think, I think in order to get to a space where you're able to do something like this, you have to heal from your fear of rejection. And I think that's why I wanna point out the whole podcast element of this is that I really want you to go back and listen to podcast episode number two, I think, where I spoke about rejection and how I overcame my fear of rejection, because I think that plays an integral part in you being able to show your true colors and be authentic in every single relationship that you're in. I mean, yes, maybe some relationships don't require 100% authenticity, like your relationship with your boss or your coworkers. I don't know how those things work because I don't have coworkers and I don't have a boss. Uh, you are my boss. So yeah, that's a bit like, ask God for discernment when it comes to those areas. But I think for me, I'm like laying your cards on the table is the best thing you can ever do because when you have accepted rejection and your relationship with rejection has been healed and is healthy, then putting your cards out on a table becomes the best thing you can do for yourself because if that person rejects you, you know they've rejected you and it's easier for you to take that and move on and start afresh somewhere else. Number two is that, number two is that when you leave the comfort zone, you immediately step into a learning zone. And when you leave the learning zone, you immediately step into the growth zone. And growth is not a bad thing. Growth means that you're gonna change, right? If you think about a butterfly, guys, I've been obsessed with butterflies lately, but that's a conversation for another day. But if you think about a butterfly, a butterfly starts off as an egg, egg becomes a caterpillar, caterpillar goes into a cocoon, cocoon breaks out and it's a butterfly. If a caterpillar in a cocoon was trying to stay in its comfort zone and never break out, they would never learn A, how to use their wings, but B, the fact that 
they could be a butterfly. Like they would never experience life of not being on the ground all the time, but being able to fly and sit on a flower, being able to fly and sit on someone's nose. I've actually never seen a butterfly sit on anyone's nose. And I pray to God that never happens to me. I don't want a butterfly on my nose. <laughs> I'd be terrified. But do you know what I mean? Imagine how much you're robbing yourself of in life, just in general, by refusing to leave the cocoon or even refusing to enter a cocoon where you're learning and you're changing and all these different things in you are developing. You never get to experience the beauty of life as a butterfly. And that to me is just sad. So leaving your comfort zone is always worth it because the moment you leave, you start to learn things. And like I said, with me and my boyfriend, because we've been so candid and transparent about who we are to one another, literally, I think it's the craziest thing because we both found ourselves at a time in our lives where we were determined to show our true colors, full colors to anyone who would even care to look. Um, and because of that, like I said, I've learned what to gift him and what not to gift him, how to kind of make him smile and what doesn't work when it comes to that. And because of that, we've grown in our relationship because I was leaving the comfort zone, learned things about him, and now we're in a better place today than we were yesterday. Same goes for him towards me. And the same goes for all my friendships. I know with one of my closest friends, my dearest friends, we went through the wildest friendship breakup or silence, I don't know what to call it, if it was a breakup or a silence, for like a good year and a half. And us being able to sit down and leave our comfort zones enough to talk about it, address the things that made us feel uncomfortable, whatever the case was. And like now, whenever there's an issue or whenever something doesn't sit well with the other person, we're quick to like, Tommy, actually, I don't really like this. Or you need to learn how to stop doing that, like calling each other out in a loving way, obviously. And I think we know that it comes from a place of love just because of our relationship and our track record with one another. So I know that whenever she calls me out on anything, it's not malicious. She doesn't hate me. She's not jealous of me. She, it comes from a genuine place. We've learned so much about each other. And I think that friendship in particular has made me a better friend in a lot of other relationships. Um, and because of that, I've grown as a person. I've grown as an individual. So leaving your comfort zone is never a bad thing. If you don't want to change and if you don't want to be a different version of yourself, an improved version of yourself 10 years from now, then don't, don't leave your comfort zone. And not to say that there's anything wrong with where you're at, but what I'm saying is nobody ever reaches completion. So if nobody ever reaches completion of fineness, if nobody ever reaches completion of intelligence, if nobody ever releases, no, releases, you know, themselves from the shackles of their comfort zone, come on somebody, then you will never get to experience the level up. And one day in your life, it will catch up with you when people have evolved and grown because they were self-aware and took the step to keep stepping out of their comfort zone. But you were too busy looking at other people, thinking they were looking at you, but really they were not looking at you. They were just in deep thought. So they just kind of looked in your direction. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you snap 50 years into the future and you realize people were stepping out of their comfort zone while you were afraid of being judged. They're living fulfilled lives now. You feel like you're behind. You feel like you're stuck. And you are behind, but you're only behind because you didn't want to take the next step in your growth, the next step in your learning so that you can become a better person. And if that's you, it's not a bad thing. You can just start today and be less years behind. <laughs> and then the last thing about the comfort zone that I wanted to share with you, and this doesn't have to be just in relationships. This can apply to any area of your life is to find an affirmation and not just like find an affirmation. Like you look in the mirror every morning. I am strong. I am beautiful. I am black. I am bold. I am intelligent. No, an affirmation as in you prayed about it and you got a word from God and you just hang on to that word because when things look shaky and your big, bad, bold decisions look like big, bad, bold decisions, you have something that anchors you in the future that you are working towards. So for me, let me tell you a little secret. I've been thinking about getting a tattoo, right? Not a big tattoo, not a serious tattoo also. And I'm still like arguing with myself because I don't believe in getting tattoos. Like I love tattoos on other people. I've got tons of friends with tattoos and I feel like 
they look so cool and there's so many elements of it that i'm just like yes girl get it but for me i'm like i need something that can act as a constant reminder to me that god is for me or you know i am still growing i don't need to be perfect that even in my imperfection i am the best because there's only one barbara in the world and an imperfect barbara according to me is not an imperfect Barbara according to everybody else because you guys don't know what a Barbara is supposed to look like. I think I know what a Barbara is supposed to look like. So obviously the standard I hold myself to is very ridiculous and very high. But the truth is I'm also a work in progress and sometimes when I show up, I show up imperfectly and some of my most imperfect podcast episodes and my most imperfect work has been my most viral work. So you never really know the potential that is sitting inside of the next stage of your life. Really, really, really go sit down and pray about it. Get conviction and conviction just means a, a sureness and a knowing on the inside of you to say, this is what I want and I don't want to settle for anything less. And then find a way to constantly keep that at the front of your mind. Um, there's a scripture that actually comes to mind and it's Habakkuk 2 verse 2 that says, write the vision down and make it plain. In, in the message translation, I think it says something like, write it in big block letters so that anyone who runs past it will be able to see it, right? You want it to just always be in your face, constantly reminding you of who you are, what you're capable of, and the future that you are destined to live in. And I think if you focus on building and sowing a seed every single day, look at it that way. Every single day, I'm sowing a seed into the relationship that I want to have, or the marriage that I want to have, the life that I want to have, lifestyle, job, house, whatever that thing is, you're putting a seed towards it every single day. And if you're too worried about what other people are saying, if you're too worried about the people that are looking at you right now, that you don't sow those seeds, 20 years down the line, you're gonna have no tree. There's a proverb that says, um, not a Bible proverb, just a proverb like in the world, or is it called an idiom? I don't know, I'm not English. <laughs> but it basically says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time to start is today. And I think what you want to do is step out of your com look at stepping out of your comfort zone every day as sowing a seed every day. And 20 years from now, you're going to reap the benefits. So while people are laughing at you for sowing right now, focus on the fact that 20 years from now, you're going to be reaping this harvest. Everyone's going to be questioning how you did it. And you're going to know it's because you took the time to take God at the word that he gave you and sow that seed every single day diligently watering it, diligently cutting away at the weeds and whatever else may arise in your garden with no one watching you, no one giving you credit for it because sometimes that's the reality of growing and glowing, right? Sorry, guys, I'm excited. Tomorrow's the To My Sisters podcast. Okay, if you're watching this, it's probably already happened, but I'm really excited about getting to sit down with Renee and Courtney and like all the sisters, just like, just be in a room of girls who are like-minded, who just... Yo, my, my thoughts are going crazy just thinking about it. But that growing and glowing journey, listen, <laughs> it's, it's not always a cute one. I even lost my train of thought. I actually, I actually completely lost my train of thought. I'm not even going to lie. That threw me off completely. Just thinking about tomorrow, I got excited, threw me off completely. Um, and all I just wanted to say was like, oh man, you're going to, you're going to thank yourself one day. Like, People don't know the work that you are putting in behind the scenes to be a more healed and whole version of yourself. And I've said this before on a different podcast that I was a guest on, that for me, I remember the journey to having a healthy and whole relationship slash future marriage and all that kinds of stuff started when I was 16, 15 years old, where that was like two, three years after my parents' divorce. And I had told myself that I am determined to never hold resentment towards my father because my dad was the one who moved out during the divorce. Obviously, like somebody stays with the house and the person who stays with the house is likely the person who stays with the kids. And because my mom was going to be our full time caretaker, she stayed and my father left. Um, and that was just the nature of the arrangement. There's nothing nothing scandalous. OK, <laughs> there's nothing scandalous about this. It's just it's just what it was. Um, but I also 
was fortunate enough to have relationships with older women and people who had gone through similar ordeals where they found themselves in toxic relationships and toxic can mean whatever or however you want to define it because they had a sort of resentment towards their father or things were not resolved or whatever. And for me, I just didn't want that. I didn't want my relationship with my dad to be a hindrance to me having a good marriage one day when I'm old. Like in my head, I thought I'd be really old. But now that I'm 24, I'm like, I'm not that old. Also, I'm not married. Just putting that out there. I'm not married yet. But yeah, it it started back then. And when I in grade 11 said to my mom, I want to go live with my dad for six months. Nobody could understand why I want to go do that. Like, why are you going to go live with your dad? That's weird. You know, you're a girl. Like, why would a girl at the time she's getting her period and all these hormonal changes are happening in your body, you're going to decide to go live with your father? That's a bit reckless. Don't you think that's a bit nonsensical? Um, but that's what it is, is that the intentional part that I was going on didn't make sense to anyone. It didn't look like a sensible decision to anybody who saw me making it at the time. So I'd go live with my dad for six months, then come back and live with my mom, and then go back and live with my dad again, come back and live with my mom. And then in varsity, I think when COVID happened, all my siblings moved in with me and my dad. And then I just never left my dad's house. So I just kind of live here now. That's just vibes. <laughs> That's just vibes. But it was because I was really determined to have a really good relationship with my father. Um, because I, I just didn't want to have daddy issues and I didn't want to have like a, an ill relationship with men. I don't want to just, I just didn't want it to be weird. I don't know. Not that people who don't have good relationships with their fathers can't have good marriages. But I think for me, that was my biggest fear at the time. Like if I don't fix this with my dad, it's not going to happen. So it was just part of me having an intentional and whole relationship, not just for my marriage, but also for my relationship with God. I didn't want the way that I related to my dad to hinder and like do snacks things to the way that I now relate to God and my relationship with God and that whole thing so that was me at the age of 15 and even when I decided to drop out of engineering that's a whole nother podcast episode um, of leaving that comfort zone telling people I'm leaving engineering to go to marketing and if you are an African child you know that Telling your parents you don't want to be a lawyer, doctor, engineer, you're going to go be a marketer instead. And this is no shade to marketer or anyone who's not a doctor, lawyer, engineer. But you are saying that, hello, mom and dad, I deliberately want to be a disgrace. Like, I deliberately want to disgrace the family. And the thing is, that's what I knew I needed to do. That's the path that I knew I needed to take in order for me to grow and in order for me to reach the potential that I knew God had placed inside of me in terms of whatever gifting and calling and whatever I felt at the time was necessary to do. It had to be done. And now I'm just living my best life as a, as a marketer. Do I know? My friends have graduated from engineering. Do I look around and think to myself, oh, I wish it, I was them. I don't. In fact, I pray for them because I'm like, I hope they are okay. Like, I hope this is something that they genuinely want. And it was a career that they pursued, not because of the opinions of African parents and society, but because it's genuinely something that they're interested in. And if it wasn't, I pray to God that they have peace and they have happiness where they're at right now, because I know what it's like to be in that space of fighting for an engineering degree tooth and nail losing your health your mind every single aspect of your life and yourself trying to pursue something that is not you for the sake of having the approval of other people around you it is hell it is rock bottom but i also learned that rock bottom is the recipe to skyrocketing success so we'll chat about that next time but I really hope that you could relate to my story in some way um, that if you didn't find any value in it, that at least you found comfort in hearing that you're not the only person in the world that experiences the things that you did. Um, you're not alone in whatever loneliness that you're feeling um, in, in not feeling like the relationships that you have in your life are enough. You're not alone in feeling guilty as a single person 
because the love of God is not enough <laughs> to keep you to keep you from feeling lonely. It's a real feeling. It's a real emotion. And it's okay for you to feel like that. But I really hope that my story and what I shared with you today will carry you in the season that is to come. And when you eventually do find love, that it would be the best love that you could have ever imagined. Yeah. Because you deserve that. You deserve to be loved just like anyone else. And you deserve to experience it in a way that is tailored to you and your heart and what your heart needs. Everyone deserves that. And I know that's what God wants for you too. So get it, girl. <laughs>